Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome again. My name is Ola. I'm from the University of Oslo. I'm the DHS Implementation Coordinator. Uh, in this session, we'll present an exciting collaboration between UNICEF, HISP Vietnam, and the University of Oslo. So the Data Exchange and Integration Platform, uh, DXP, is an initiative by UNICEF to link global survey data uh, to national DHS2 uh, routine data. UNICEF and UIO, we work together uh, to make the, the global survey data available on the DHIS platform, DHIS format, and integrated with the WHO indicators and visualizations from the digital packages that we have talked a lot about this week. Um, East Vietnam then developed a custom app to be able to do some of the more advanced uh, triangulation visualizations uh, that we could not do through the standard applications. East Vietnam is also supporting a pilot of this project in Laos. Uh, Tyler Port from UNICEF's data and analytics section will start by presenting the concept uh, and the design, and then John will take over and give us a demo of the cool visualizations and talk about the process of integrating this in Laos. Um, we'll try to make time for some questions at the end. Remember that you have to post your questions in the COP page. You can find the link either in the SCED agenda app or in the, in the Zoom chat that we have here. And then I'll, I'll pick a few and we try to respond. And then we'll respond to everything uh, in writing on the COP page after, the, after this session. So thank you everyone for joining and over to Tyler. All right. Thanks, Ola. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining as well. And I'd also just like to start the session today um, from my end by just taking a moment to thank uh, the organizers of the conference. Um, I know it's been a crazy last nine months or so, so I'm always appreciative of how much work goes into um, pulling off these, these virtual events. Um, and it's always exciting to see people able to still come together for this. So thank you so much for that. Um, as Ola mentioned, you know, in this session, we'll be talking and describing the data exchange and integration platform, um, which is an effort that we've been working on to facilitate large scale bidirectional data exchange, integration and triangulation, um, leveraging both global and national level data systems. Um, and then at the end, I'll hand it over to my colleague, John, um, who will walk through a, a live demo um, of, the, of the current platform. Um, so here's a brief overview. Um, kind of discussed that, so I won't spend any more time on it. I'll just jump right in. Um, so the reason for this effort is the pervasive challenge of fragmentation between data systems. Uh, we know and talk a lot about fragmentation within countries, um, but there are also critical challenges that exist between the global and national level data systems. Um, and importantly, there are some significant opportunities um, that we could leverage if we could reduce this fragmentation. Um, and when we look at data systems at the global and national levels, we see that data have uh, different primary sources. So at the global level, we're typically talking about household survey data and modeled estimates. And at the national level, um, really talking about, um, you know, routine administrative data. Um, and these platforms are often, you know, managed on incompatible platforms um, and non-standard data structures and definitions. Um, and because of this, it leads to insufficient data sharing, um, both across and within countries and regions. Uh, resulting in uh, inadequate data utilization and suboptimal programs and results. Um, and if we look deeper into these data sources, um, we see that they each have advantages and limitations. Um, but I think what's really important here is that these comparative advantages and limitations are complementary. So if we look at frequency, you know, at the global level systems, you, you know, for a country, you're really only getting an update every two to three years. Um, you know, at the national level, obviously you have more frequent, you know, hence the routine uh, data system. So you're talking about monthly, if not weekly or, or daily updates, depending on the data. Um, when you talk about geographic granularity, um, you know, at the, at the global level, you know, you're usually only getting one, maybe two levels of sub-national disaggregation, whereas nationally you have data down to the district level or the facility level or community level and sometimes even individual. Um, but at the global level, um, you know, we also have data that are sampled for valid coverage estimation, whereas at the national systems, you have persistent challenges with denominators to be able to come up with, you know, accurate population-based coverage estimates. Um, 
you know, at the global level, the, the data are designed to be population-based coverage estimates, um, whereas you often have facility-based co coverage estimates at the national level. Um, and then, like, at the global level, you're also able to, you know, whereas at the national level, the data you're getting are usually limited to your access, your coverage, and your quality, whereas through the global level data systems, the surveys, and you're, you're able to capture additional domains like knowledge and attitudes and practices, access, demand, coverage, and quality. And you also have, you know, you're able to disaggregate your, your data beyond just the, the age and, and sex that you usually have in a, in a national system, which, you know, is inherently limited by the aggregation process. Um, and at the global level data systems, you're able to, um, to really disaggregate not only by age and sex, but often by education and wealth and residence, ethnicity, language, and a whole host of other of other um, parameters. Uh, and so because of this, because of these sort of complementary advantages and limitations, we found that integrating and triangulating between these two data systems can provide a great opportunity to improve our understanding of health system performance. So this is the ultimate objective behind the data exchange platform or DXP as we'll call it here, um, is to connect these data systems at the global and national levels and integrate and triangulate the data sets. So what is DXP exactly? It's a proof of concept intermediary platform. It's aligned to both the international standard definitions for survey estimates and, and, and global models, as well as your routine health uh, facility reported indicators. Um, and it can facilitate bi-directional exchange of data between global and national systems and support the integration and triangulation of those data sets. Um, in terms of the role of UNICEF, we really see ourselves as just proving the technological feasibility, sustainability, and value of this approach. And our, uh, our plan is to generate evidence to advocate for a more long-term multi-agency um, solution to data exchange and integration, possibly within the, the, under the umbrella of the Health Data Collaborative, or one of the, uh, the interagency SDG groups or something along those lines. Um, and something that can be more sort of sustainable in the long term to support data quality use and reporting. Um, and just to note as well that we're currently limiting our effort to health data in SDMX ADX standard as our test case, but we do have the intent to show that this is scalable to other sectors and standards. And we've already had some discussions with co colleagues um, from the education sector as well. So what are some of the opportunities we have seen for integrating global data sets into national HMIS? This is important because this is really the primary focus of, the, of this effort is how can we get more data to countries in the systems and platforms that they're already using in a way that meets one of their specific data needs? Um, and what functionality does this process allow at the national and subnational level? Um, you can see them listed here, but more nuanced trends and analysis. Uh, validation and calibration of routine data and coverage estimates from your routine systems, um, calculation of smaller area denominators, apportioning national estimates to smaller areas, and estimating service coverage that's not currently captured in HMIS. So for example, you know, if you're not integrating community level data or you don't have good reporting from the private sector, you can offset some of those challenges by pulling in population-based coverage estimates from surveys and, and using that to to sort of triangulate a proper coverage estimate from both sources. Um, and likewise, we're looking at not just pushing data to the countries, but also seeing if we can reverse the flow of data for a select set of government approved and authorized indicators, um, because we feel that this has the potential um, for to, to have a greater range of data available at the global level to improve um, estimation and analysis, analysis efforts, um, but also, there's an opportunity here for countries to have greater representation in, in the global databases while also automating some of the reporting mechanisms for these select administrative data. So essentially working towards more frequent data updates and more data coverage uh, while at the same time reducing some of the burden on countries and international organizations so that you know, you're not having to go through these manual ad hoc processes to report the same numbers to 12 different you know, partners at the global level trying where, you know, we're having discussions on how we can consolidate and, and, and automate some of that to make it a bit more uh, user friendly for, for countries and, and, and development partners alike. Um, I'll, I'll be quick on this slide. So I think an important question is why now? Um, you know, there have been some recent developments at both the global and national levels that have really made this effort possible. Um, globally, we have the adoption of common data standards at UNICEF and, and the SDGs and, and, and many other partners. Um, so we have this uh, 
sort of uh, convergence on a common data standard there. Um, we have overhauled and modernized our UNICEF data architecture with unified codes and data structure definitions, which allows us to um, have greater access to a larger range of data to push to countries. Um, and then also the development and rollout of the indicator standards for the facility reported data in HMIS, which are the WHO UNICEF packages that, that Ulo was referring to and have been you know, mentioned several times throughout this conference. Um, and then nationally, we're looking at uh, alignment to you know, talking about you know, the opportunity that there's gradual alignment towards the HMIS uh, indicator standards, um, as well as prolifer proliferation of DHIS2 and the ADX standard. And this is really important because, you know, I think if, if there had been a decree 10 years ago that, you know, every, every country has to start using a single data standard, I'm not sure how successful that would have been, but because of the success of the DHIS2 program, that has also led to a large scale adoption of a common data standard, which allows us to create solutions um, that work for many countries um, from the get-go. So I think that's a huge, um, huge factor. Um, and then on the technology side, you know, the, the standard that we've been adopting mostly at the global level, SDMX, and the standard that's being largely adopted in ministries of health um, through DHIS2, is ADX, are two very complementary standards. And, and in fact, um, ADX was sort of just a specification built on top of an underlying SDMX standard. So it's, it, it's quite straightforward to get the two standards to speak to each other, which was sort of a serendipitous opportunity that we've been trying to take advantage of here. Now on the approach, that we know this isn't the first effort to integrate survey data and estimates into HMIS. Uh, UNICEF, you know, we've supported other efforts. Um, I'm sure other partners in here have as well. And we, you know, we've, we've learned from those. Um, but I want to just mention briefly how our approach is a bit different. Um, you know, one is the, the fact that this is bidirectional and mutually beneficial. So it, it facilis, facilitates the national level data use, analysis, and quality processes while also expanding global databases with greater country representation. Um, it's not the introduction of a new parallel tool. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking recommended triangulation methods uh, and data workflows and trying to build them directly into the HMIS system or the, the, what the platform that the Ministry of Health is already using. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not something where you, know, you learn a tool one time and then you're not using it, so you just kind of quit using it. Like we're trying to build it directly into the, the software and the platforms that you're already using every day. Um, the country implementation in HMIS can also be custom customized. So we have custom dashboards, data processes, visualizations, and apps that you can develop from the backend data. Um, and it's been developed in partnership with the DHIS2 program, which as we all know here has a large expert community providing sustained support to countries uh, for troubleshooting, customization, implementation. Um, and I think that community is, is, on, uh, is prominently on display this week. Um, so that's another huge benefit for this approach. Um, another thing that I just want to note is since this is a proof of concept, we've, we've, and it's meant to inform a more long-term solution, we've taken an intentionally simplified approach. And by that, I mean there are some conscious trade-offs that, that have been made. So we've conceded that at the moment, this will be limited to aggregate data and representative sample data. We're not going into individual level data at this time. Um, and we're starting with a, with a limited range of data sources. Um, trying to start small. So this is not an interoperability layer or a massive data lake system. This is, you know, in, and so any countries interested in those other solutions, we would encourage you to still pursue those. Um, we're just trying to start small and improve the, the technology um, and a large scale sustainability and, and scalability of this. Um, and so by conceding those, we've developed a solution that is extremely affordable, requires minimal training and capacity development, we believe, has low demands on existing ICT and data architecture, does not require the introduction of parallel tools, so it can be deployed directly in HMIS. Um, and therefore, we believe this solution is highly deployable, highly adaptable, sustainable, and scalable. So that's all the sort of theoretical concepts behind it. Now let's sort of get into what this, um, what this actually looks like. Um, so first, just sort of as a background, I want to just give a real quick snapshot of UNICEF's data architecture. Um, so this is the current UNICEF global data system. It's called Helix. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but do want to draw your attention to this middle box right here. Uh, just to note that we have a data source catalog, which has raw microdata from thousands, probably tens of thousands of surveys and, and international models. 
Um, and then that goes through a mixed data working system where we produce the indicator values and disaggregations. And then those uh, values are pushed into a, a dot stat SDMX warehouse. Um, and from that warehouse, it can be pushed out to different various uh, consumer interfaces. Um, and I won't go into each of those, but you'll see that the blue one is the one that is relevant here where um, we've been working on specifying DHIS2 compatibility from our um, SDMX backend. Um, and then just to go into the, yeah, so uh, go into just a quick note on the mixed data working system as well. So this um, slide shows how the, the data get called out of our, our source catalog into an Azure data lake. Uh, we run an R package that standardizes and harmonizes the data across all of the tens of thousands of surveys. Um, and then that harmonized, standardized uh, raw data um, set is, is maintained in a harmonized database, also in Azure or SQL. Um, and then we have a, another R script that's run that can aggregate, calculate, validate, test, and visualize those indica indicator data and push them out to various, um, to various interfaces, including the, the dots that warehouse. So you, you'll see all of this referred to simply as Helix, which is the name of our architecture. Um, so that was the UNICEF databases. Now let's, let's talk about DXP. Um, so phase one, which was completed in March of this year, um, we developed the DXP, which is the intermediary platform that's developed in, H in DHIS2. It's aligned to the core health indicators from, from the survey estimates and the core RMNCAH um, WHO UNICEF package um, for you know, in-country facility reported uh, indicator definitions. Um, and then we developed uh, an ETL that can call data from the UNICEF global databases um, through the Helix has a RESTful API. And those data are you know, restructured more or less to the ADX standard and then stored in this DXP platform where they can be made available to countries. Um, and phase two is where we're looking to actually deliver our data to countries and support integration and triangulation in the national HMIS platforms. Um, so obviously part of this is developing data sharing agreements and defining user groups and roles, um, but then you know, mapping out the, and aligning the, the data elements and indicators and the organizational units. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but then we can make, once we've done that, we can make our, make our data available through the installation of configuration packages, um, which you know, we'll talk about a little bit more in a bit, but basically there are configuration packages for the metadata and the dashboards, which are imported. And, and map to the national system for the data elements. And then once that mapping has been done, you can import the configuration package for the data uh, to populate the dashboards. And then those, um, we're working on dashboard development and customization with countries. Um, and then obviously, as we're looking to implement this, some user acceptance training and, and testing is, is important as well. Um, and then once we've already sort of built this connection um, with countries who opt into this approach. Um, we want to leverage these mechanisms to facilitate data flowing back from the country to the global level um, to facilitate easier global reporting. You know, again, I'm talking about data sharing agreements, user groups and roles, all, some additional alignment and mapping possibly, um, but then working out a data exchange mechanism based on the country's preference. Um, and then of course, some training. Um, so speaking quickly about the data exchange mechanisms, um, so between Helix and DXP, um, you know, already mentioned the development of the, the RESTful API and the ETL that calls data from, from Helix and, and pulls it into DXP. Um, and from there, um, we can make it available to countries um, based on their preferences. So we have different options that you see here on the screen. We have the configuration packages, other ways to use the API, there's the data import app. Um, and then similarly, when we're talking about pushing data from the country level back up to the DXP platform, um, you know, where, you know, you can use the API again, data import app, or you can create standard, standard reporting forms to do this. So there, you know, there's a variety of mechanisms available to us. It just comes down to um, the country's comfort and preference and, and how they choose to and prefer to proceed on that. Um, again, don't want to go into too much detail here on the ETL, but just wanted to put this, um, this slide up here as well. So, you know, I think for the ETL, we're talking about how you, you know, the script to extract it from Helix to transform it into the proper um, structures and standards, and then load that into um, into the DXP platform. Um, so this has been developed in JavaScript using uh, Node.js, um, and uh, the documentation is here on our GitHub repo. Um, so we have the we have the link there. Um, and so the vision is that we would we have this ETL um, that, and we would probably end up developing another one to pull data back from DXP into the backend data systems. 
at UNICEF um, and other partners, like if we're working with other reporting partners that, you know, that countries have to report to, where, you, you know, when we publish new data sets, you know, we just, you know, if we publish a new data set every three months and, and update to our backend data system, we can just publish that and push it out to countries so that they can have the most recent data available from our end back in their, um, in their HMIS system. Um, so briefly on the scope of indicators, uh, you know, we, you know, as part of the planning, we mapped out the overlap between the global and national level indicators so that we could select priority indicators for this test case. And we found we have 45 core health indicators in our database. There were 48 core indicators in the RMNCAH WHO UNICEF uh, package uh, with an overlap of 30 where some triangulation validation or comparison is possible. Um, but for the purpose of this uh, concept, proof of concept, we, um, we've scaled down to focus on 34 indicators from um, our backend databases uh, and also 34 indicators from the HMIS packages um, with an overlap of 28. Um, but I think it's also important to note here that in reality, we know that country tests will be focused on a much smaller number of indicators, uh, you know, maybe around 10 to 12 in most cases. And that's really due to the availability of data and the definition of indicators um, being compatible, needing to be compatible in, in both systems. So there's a note on the, um, on the indicators and data elements. We've also given consideration to how to align a, a sort of, you know, multi-data system organizational hierarchy. Um, so in green here, you see the, the UNICEF organizational hierarchy where we have global and then we have UNICEF regions and then we have countries and then we have subnational areas, um, usually down to admin one or admin two level. Um, and whereas in, the, in, a, in a hypothetical country here, you, you have the, the national level at the top, you know, basically your, your data typically goes from facilities to like a district level and then often to like either a region or directly to the national level. Um, so the common areas here are the national level and the uh, first administrative level. Um, and so what we're doing is during implementation, we simply import the subnational organizational hierarchy from the national HMIS system. We're not trying to prescribe that for you know, all countries globally, but at, if and when a country opts in to, to test this um, and implement this, that they, we would just import their subnational organizational hierarchy, and then we can match the respective hierarchies at the national and admin one level. Um, so that's, that's it on the, the, the design overall. I have a couple quick notes here on what we've achieved so far, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to John to start to walk through um, the, uh, the, the demo. Um, so where we are now is we've developed the DHIS2 platform that's aligned to the indicators, we, um, and we, we've written the ETL um, to call data from the UNICEF backends into DXP and make it available to countries. Um, we've mapped out the indicators and aligned organizational units in our first test case, and uh, we've de developed a generic dashboard app and user interface in the DXP DHIS2 platform, which you'll hear, see here in a second. Um, so our, our core results really are down there at the bottom. It's the HMIS compatible DS data structure definition in DXP um, and storing health data there, the customized data use app, um, and successful remote staging and testing in uh, with the Laos uh, HMIS um, platform. Um, some other developments um, that that we've had is just sort of you know, it's, we've, been, we've had the opportunity to work with the, the development, the analytics, and the quality teams at DHIS2 um, to look at how this approach can be adapted more broadly in DHIS2 systems, um, how this approach could potentially improve data quality processes in DHIS2, for example, uh, basically creating a systematic mechanism for external validation and triangulation with more robust and independent data sources. Um, and then also looking at sort of the analytics roadmap and, and you know, what sort of improvements are already planned and what additional improvements could be, could be made in the coming years to make an approach like this um, even better for countries. Um, and then we've also, I want to draw attention to this note at the bottom here around data sharing. Um, so this is also, this project has also led to some really interesting discussions at the global level with a lot of the, the major development partners and, and, and donors and multilaterals and bilaterals. Um, and these discussions uh, on how to reduce some of the inefficiencies around some of the data sharing agreements um, so that we can reduce burden on countries while allowing greater data sharing um, with lower effort. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we know that oftentimes at you know, different points throughout the year, you're submitting the same numbers to different agencies um, kind of over and over and you're just kind of having to do the same thing through inefficient processes and 
um, we're, we're having discussions on our end to see if there are opportunities to leverage a mechanism like this and then for us to coordinate across the agencies at the global level to make that a bit more efficient and reduce some of the burden on countries. I won't go into too much detail here, but just wanted to share the project timeline. Last year, it was all about conceptual design, uh, resource mobilization, um, uh, initiating phase one, um, which, we, which we finished earlier at the end of uh, Q1 2020. Um, we've also had, a, as, you know, as many of us have experienced, there's been a brief interruption of this work while responding to, to COVID. Um, but we are now moving forward again with our first country testing in Laos very soon. Um, so we hope, which we expect to continue into 2021. Um, and then we'll also be looking at looking for an additional one to two countries um, for additional testing either later this year or early in 2021 so that we can ensure that uh, the evidence that's generated from this approach is based on a, a sufficiently large sample of, uh, of, of countries and, and uh, contexts. Um, so with that, I will stop for now and I will turn it over to my colleague John who's going to walk us through um, uh, a demo of the platform and, and discuss this in a bit more detail. Thanks. John, I stopped sharing, so it should be available to you now. Uh, hi all, if you can uh, hear me now. Okay, so I'm just going to try to show like uh, what we have done with the um, uh, DXP uh, dashboard. Uh, before going into the, the dashboard itself, I just wanted to go through a few of the things, how it uh, works, just a bit of a background. Um, most of you are familiar with um, DHRs to data entry. So this is the, the one of the screen like which we which where we imported all the the data uh, from the the survey. So you can see all your um, the, um, the DXP survey data from the Helix system stored in your own local DHIS2 instance. So these are the the few of the data items what we try to get. Plus, apart from that one, you have your own um, country DHIS2. Um, uh, data, um, like for example, like for yeah, most of the places, like it will be, this is the from the survey data, and then like you have the HMIs population, and then your local country data elements and the data sets, which are basically collected at the district hospital level or the facility level, and then once you aggregate that one, then you are comparing your routine HMIs data as well as your survey data together. To, to make that one happen, what we try to develop with the His Vietnam is a, it's a small uh, app, which is called Integrated Health Data Dashboard, a DXP, which basically compares your HMIs reported data and your census and the, the survey data from the uh, Helix system, which is adjusted around across. So these are the, the few charts which we've been trying to, to get through from the, the Helix system. Um, where you can also just see few of the um, uh, potential uh, outputs. One is like comparing your um, key demographic uh, data around. Uh, and also you can also um, customize furthermore to just to see your um, live birth data across um, uh, different uh, uh, region. One of the other things why we didn't go for a creation of the um, uh, using DHS2 dashboard was we wanted to have the coding specific uh, charts, uh, which is now available in, uh, in 34, 35 release. But like before that one, like it was not available, but also like few of the other charts. Um, for example, like all the HMIs reported data are coded as um, blue, and then the, the sensors are in red, and then the, the adjusted, uh, the one are in, uh, uh, in yellow. So this kind of uh, things goes through across all the, the charts. So it's, it's easier to comprehend what data is coming from HMIs, what data is coming from the survey, like and how best we can try to compare across. So these are the, the few things based on the, the indicator what has been selected and the visualization. So we have been showing a few of the, the charts and each and every widget can be downloaded um, into PNG, which can be used for the 
uh, presentation uh, in the PPT. We are also making a focus on how best we can try to get the entire dashboard um, in a, a more uh, uh, PDF format or individual chart format uh, altogether. That's something which is going to come around, come across. Um, but further, like uh, more things, like we are also included a few of the charts on here, which is compares across the selling section data, postnatal care. And this one is more about on the, um, the provincial wise um, uh, coverage. So how is your HMI's data is showing compared to your, your survey data? Uh, plus a few of the, the charts and maps. We also, like since we are restricting ourselves to the national and the district level, these are the few of the charts what we try to get with the different legends. So this is the basic overview. And plus, like once we have more and more data configured and the country needs, we can include more uh, charts uh, type or the more theme, thematic areas, which can be included around here. Um, this is the basic demo, like where we are trying to, to get the, the Helix data and as well as um, uh, show um, um, the comparison across the survey data and the, the HMI looking data. Um, there are a few, currently like all the configuration is done in a JSON file where you map all the, the data, what is relevant. And based on that, when we are showing uh, things up, uh, his Vietnam is trying to develop a, a admin tool so that like the, the country admin uh, person can configure the, um, uh, or, or map the data, what is relevant uh, from the, the survey data to the, the HMI sorting data so that they can like have try to get the similar kind of charts. Um, other things which we are also working on is on the translation, which is also very key to try to, to, to get it around uh, for different, both on the data side and as well as the UI uh, to see every, all these uh, things in a, in a, in a multifunctional level uh, using DHS2 translation. Um, apart from that one, I guess like that's, uh, that's all from me. So we can try to open it for the question. Oh, oh, sorry, I'll hand over to you, um, uh, Tyler, again. Thanks, John. Yeah, please go ahead, Tyler. You can share. All right, thanks so much, John. Um, let me see here. I'll share my screen just really quickly uh, as we wrap this up and then open it up for questions. I, I did just want to maybe just take one second um, first to just, um, the as, as you could see in the dashboard that, that John showed, I. I think having those data side by side, you know, it's still, this is our early prototypes and it's still a bit, you know, simple in the approach and we're, we're continuing to look for ways to, to strengthen and, and improve that, but already you can see some of the value. So there's several of those where you look at different, um, different denominators, um, some of the common denominators that we're using for many coverage estimates and you can see the variation by data source. Um, and then there are charts that flip those denominators to show what impact they might have on, um, on, uh, coverage estimate. So if you're looking at BCG, depending on where you're pulling that live births estimate, you might have 140% coverage or you might have 65% coverage. And so uh, having that understanding of what's in your system, I think is really important to inform how you're interpreting and using the data in the system. There's also uh, charts that show like by vaccine and by, you know, for different coverage interventions, the, the coverage estimate from the surveys versus the coverage estimate from the uh, from the uh, national HMIS, which allows you to, you know, see how closely they align, aligned they are, and also to look at if they're become if they're converging over time to, you know, to indicate and in, you know improvement of, of of data sources, and also some which show you like even at the subnational level, um, you know, because we would expect more or less the same relationship between provinces when it comes to coverage estimate, whether you're looking at data from the national HMIS or whether you're looking at from the National Household Survey Program. And in many cases we see that, but you do see some outlier districts which, you know, either have significantly higher or lower coverage estimate depending on one of those data sources when they should be pretty similar. So it allows you to um, have a little bit more nuance in interpreting the data and using that, but also it, I think it's a really useful tool for flagging data quality, like potential data quality issues. Um, so that you can drill down into those a bit more um, and try to figure out, you know, if it's a, if there's a, there's one in there, like there was one thing in there that was like a 6,500% coverage, which it, it's blaringly, glaringly obvious on, on the dashboard. And it allows you to go in and say, this is probably a data entry error. Um, 
um, and, and identify some of those challenges. Um, so thank you, John, for, for walking through that and for all the His Vietnam support and developing and configuring that tool. I also just wanted to acknowledge um, every, you know, several people who have contributed to this. So we've had UNICEF and WHO colleagues who have supported sort of the design and conceptualization of, of all this. We've had um, generous support from USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, you know, obviously the whole team um, at DHIS2 and the, at UIO and, and the HISP group in Vietnam. Um, and then our, our colleagues from the Ministry of Health and, and Laos and the, and the, the Lao office uh, from WHO as well. Uh, so just wanted to take a moment there to uh, thank them for their contributions to this. And then I think we can then go ahead and open it up for discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tyler. And thanks, John. Um, I've been pushing a bit in the chat to, to post more questions. We have two and I see one in the making. Okay, we just got the third one in now. Uh, Tyler, I have one for you first uh, from Carlos Herrera from the Ministry of Health in Honduras. He's uh, asking, um, how can Ministry of Health Honduras uh, do a similar implementation? We have the HIS, but next step is exactly this one, integration and data exchange. Please let us know. Do you want me to, do we want to answer each of these individually? Yeah, or do you want to take we don't have that many. Okay, perfect, yeah. yeah. Just go ahead. And other people, please post your questions. We still have uh, more than 10 minutes, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, no, thanks so much. It's a great question. Um, you know, I think the first thing to do, obviously, is just expression of interest, and we can connect. Uh, I have my email here um, that, that you'll see on the screen now. Um, so, you know, for, for Honduras and anyone else who may be interested, would, would love to start that discussion. Um, you know, I, there's, there are some criteria that we typically look for in a country to make sure that we think it's, a, it's one that is a suitable test country. Um, but but there are there are a lot of options that we have on, on how to sort of a, adapt this to to deploy it in countries. Um, you know it'll depend a lot on the the system you have in place, um, the amount of data you have, the amount of data we have for Honduras to try to make sure that it's uh, sort of a mutually beneficial effort to implement this. You know we we you know basically we don't want to go through a ton of work and 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 start field testing this in a country and then we find out that oh this is like one of those countries we only have one survey for and so we're really not providing a, a ton of value or if we're giving you one 10 year old survey um i don't think that's the case for honduras but just sort of as a general note um but yeah i, th I think we'd love to have that discussion and and look at the the platforms you're using at the national level to see if it's one that we can that we can relatively easily you know work towards field testing and then sort of start mapping out indicators and looking at the organizational unit alignment. There are a few cases where um, the mapping of the, the org units will be a, very challenging. So like, for example, if, uh, if the DHS and mixed surveys that you're doing in your country are all based on administrative divisions, but then you have some completely separate health divisions that are used in the Ministry of Health, um, that's, that's a bit more challenging. It's not to say that it's not ever going to be possible, but it, it's a lot of work for a field test for a proof of concept. So the, those may not be some of the most suitable um, options for, for some of these initial one or two field tests. Um, but, but most countries, that's, that's really not an issue and we can, we can work towards finding a solution for, for field testing if, if there's interest from the ministry. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Um, okay, we have two more. It's a bit more technical. Um, we have one from Joseph in Tanzania. Um, he's asking, some countries allow integration of DHS2 with other systems via an interoperability layer. Does DXP also adopt that, that approach uh, or is the integration done peer-to-peer? -peer? In example, Tanzania is using health information mediator. No, like, uh, I guess like one of the things what we've been trying to, to focus on is how best you can try to compare the survey data with your routine HMIS data with based on certain uh, standards and the comparison. For example, the things which I'm just showing around here, like in the survey data, it shows uh, it's 94% uh, coverage and the HMIS is 79. More closer around here to in this particular province, the survey and HMIS are nearly okay. But this one is... Um, quite far where survey is 83, HMIS is 19. So these kind of standard, standard tools or comparison with the different surveys out there, uh, data coming from, it's good to like have multiple source of data. I guess that's also the, the uh, what Tyler was addressing on the, the first question. We can try to include uh, many source, but 
the first source we'll try uh, focusing on is this one. And based on that one, we can try to use um, any other, other source now. And using the DHST API, you can try to always push the data into two things. We are not focusing on, um, like you already know the DHS to standards where to push the data. So we're just like making a, a generic tool so that like you can decide how many survey or the things you want to try to configure based on this one. That's something which is going to try to build on at the later part. So there are supposed to be a bit more discussion. We're testing it out with, the, with Lao, with a few of the other surveys and the things. So when we have one more pilot, maybe in Tanzania in year 2021, like we can try to also just see what all the other different surveys which you can try to be include and how the chart should represent when we are having three or four different sources of data to compare. Yeah. I have one thing to add on the ETL or the interoperability approach here. I think one, one thing to important to understand is that we are not, uh, this tool is not an interoperability tool to use in countries between systems. It's basically taking the, the global survey data in the Helix system globally and transferring it over to a global DHS2 instance, a repository. And, and from there, we can distribute this through the standards or the import export approach in DHS uh, through both for the metadata and for the data itself. So the actual uh, move to get this data into a country is much more the sort of the normal import export process with DHIS and, and linking it very similar to how we do the WHO packages, being able to map it to data elements and importing data. Yeah, I think that's Maybe a... Maybe you can say a little bit about how you did that in Lao, John, so people can understand. Yeah, but Tyler. based on the... Sorry? I said Tyler was going to say something. So maybe... no, yeah, yeah, go ahead, John, you go first, yeah. Uh, based on the, the discussion what we had with Tyler and, and with the Ula a long time back, so this was they, they had the, all the different uh, indicators and also we wanted to to see like whether like Lao are collecting this uh, data in the routine HMIs. That was the first step, and then we identify these are all the indicators which has been collected in the routine HMIs, and we can compare that one to the to the survey data, and then we just say what are the additional surveys what we try to to have. So based on that one, we, we try to to map the data so what can be compared between routine uh, hmis data and with the uh, with the survey data which is which makes sense to to see um, um, uh, side by side and see like how best uh, uh, the both of the systems are working around one of the the main things in many countries what we always just say survey data is always lower compared to the hmis data hmis data is always higher but in some of the indicators are nearly the same. Some of the indicators, especially the mortality and other things are very different. But like it's just to see like how best we want try to, to bring this um, gap closer. The one of the way to bring this gap closer is by displaying this one in a, in a dashboard way so that like not only the, the only the key health administrator at the national level, but also at the, the program level and the things they can see like how things are happening across a different programmatic uh, program area. Definitely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, John. And just to just to to build on, on Ula and John's response, like uh, being able to 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 combine data from your HMIS and your LMIS and your CHIS and your various you know other systems, IRIS, all those, is really important. And this is not the solution that's going to do that. Um, so, so that's why we continue to encourage countries to look at in-country interoperability layers that that can that can provide some of the solutions. This is really meant to basically take a lot of global data, put it in the same structure and standard that's compatible with DHIS2 systems and make a very simple process that can make that data available to cut to immediately, you know, 65-ish countries um, so that they can have access to that and do sort of a, a simple um, triangulation that, that, that we've sort of demonstrated here. But what I'll say too is if you're in a country like Tanzania where uh, interoperabilities are layers are being discussed and considered and, and developed. And so if you do have a system that pulls in data from your LMIS or your IRIS or you know other, other information systems in the country, there might also be additional indicators that we haven't included in this field test that would be relevant from our back end too. So having that will also enable potentially a larger share of data from our data systems um, to the national level. 
um, cause it, it might allow us to, you know, work with our supply division and, and share some of our commodity data and then and other logistics data, um, that we could, that we could sort of combine on, but, but the sort of immediate, um, test case is just looking at coverage data from HMIS compatible with our coverage data from our, our global data systems. Yeah. Thanks, Tyler. I mean, there was one more question, a little bit related, I think, to what we just said. Uh, Mwene from Zambia is asking, uh, in terms of the tool selection for the ETL tool, why we use the custom Node.js uh, script uh, versus using some existing ETL tools out there. Um, I don't think Stian is actually on the, the call. He, he, he made that decision. But I just want to emphasize, it's a very, very simple tool. You cannot go to GitHub and look at it. It's, it's a very sort of basic, uh, process. I would also reflect on this a little bit and say that uh, what was really the complex thing here was to try to model the, the survey data on the DHIS data model because we designed the DHIS data model for routine data and it doesn't fit perfectly well with the survey data, especially with the time periods and being very different, uh, confidential intervals. A lot of this complexity is now sort of dealt with in this uh, tool, in the package, in, in the metadata and the data you can download. Uh, and I think that can make it a little bit easier for countries to, to use this data in, in, in sort of easy access way on DHIS. A lot of countries have this data already in spreadsheets, et cetera, and have tried, you know, with various levels of success to try to import this and use it in DHIS before. Um, but I think that to me, I think is one of the big wins here is to, that we can help to try to model and integrate the data uh, from a data modeling and design perspective, maybe more than the ETL technical side. Um, we don't have any more questions. We have about five minutes. Tyler, John, you want to add anything? Yeah, maybe if I could just build on that point, you were just uh, saying, well, let me find this. I have uh, some additional slides buried back here in the back, and I want to talk about why we gave so much thought to um, so maybe first, just to show this um, from the colleague from, from Honduras, these are some of the criteria we look at um, for uh, when we're talking about opportunities to, to pilot. So, you know, does your country have DHIS2 or other ADX standard in use at the national scale? Um, have, is there decent alignment with some of the global indicator um, definitions? Um, do we have ample data in our back end that we could provide? Um, and do we have subnational area alignment um, between sort of our Helix structure and HMIS in terms of the, the data sources. So that's where we get into like the administrative versus the health districts and things like that. Um, and then I wanted to share one more. Nope, I guess I don't have it in here. Um, so there's a, yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, so basically what I wanted to show, here I'll go back to, I have a slide where this will work. So basically the reason we put so much thought into how best to, um, to, to model the data is because we wanted to have uh, you can see it a little bit here, um, where basically these these green um, indicators or these these green values here come from surveys, um, and you see you have some that you know cover multiple years of field work and collection, and some that are in a single year. But we also for each one you can you can see them here a little bit. You have you know your sort of median, your point estimate with a lower and upper um, estimate for for coverage from that indicator, and we wanted to see the the way that. Uh, the degree to which the the trends from the the national HMIS coverage estimates fit within these sort of expected bounds, we would expect this this line here, this blue line, to cross through, um, you know, these these two data points within this sort of this box right here, um, and so that required us to give quite a bit of consideration to how can you have like a single value that coverage a, a range of time periods and has sort of a point estimate, but also a lower and upper estimate. And we want all of that to be something that we can compare to sort of a single trend line um, coming out of HMIS. So that's, as Ola said, that's, I think that's a big win is trying to figure out how to, to model that and also how to um, be able to take data from an SDMX warehouse at the global level and make that available to countries because, you know, we're seeing it, um, UNICEF, we've done it. The SDG database has done it in terms of moving to SDMX. Um, we're also having those discussions for the, the UN system as a whole. I'm actually sort of working with the Secretary General's office right now on the implementation of a new data strategy, which among other things looks at sort of the technology environment and trying to make uh, sort of a common data backends for all the agencies and departments and offices that can sort of have a more strategic asset value for the um, um, 
for, for the way they view data and make that available to countries and partners and, and the world. Um, so I think those are two of the, the big wins sort of related to the, to the data modeling and sort of the, the simple exchange mechanisms that have been developed. Great. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I'm looking at the COP. We still have only those five. I think we addressed everything. Uh, I know many of you are watching this uh, as a recording on YouTube. So please remember that you can still put your questions on the COP. We'll keep the COP open. Of course, that's uh, a long-term tool for us to, to engage. Uh, we'll also, I think, post updates there from the Lao experience. And the idea will be if we can continue for those that are interested to follow this initiative and and post questions later or get updates to stay on the COP and, and you know we can we can continue the discussions and communication there. Any last words, Tyler or John, before we close? Nothing for me other than just to say thanks everyone for attending and for your participation. And and you have my email there. So if you have any other questions or want to discuss potential opportunities in, in your country or, or partners you're working with, please uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out and we'll be happy to have that discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot to Tyler and John for doing the presentation and thanks everyone for joining and asking questions. And uh, the next session will start in six minutes. Thank you everyone and goodbye. Thanks. Bye.